too. Praise the Lord. Someone says here, please turn on the nursery monitor. Did that get done? Jennifer will take care of it if it didn't. Praise the Lord. In the cry room monitor, whatever it is. In case I have to go back there and cry, I can hear myself. <laughs> we do believe, and this is a hopeless and desperate generation that we're living in. Most people don't realize it. Uh, they're so accustomed to desperation and despair and emptiness in, this, in the world that we're living in. They fail to realize that there is something better. There is, let me put it this way, there is someone better. And that someone is the Lord Jesus Christ, whom we place our faith and our hope and our, 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 our lives within his hands. Praise the Lord. I want to share with you something that's on my heart today, and it really follows well, I think, with what we've been preaching and teaching the last several weeks, and the crucifixion, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, the outcome of the resurrection. But before I do, let me just say, ladies, this is your chance. It's the last day that you can get signed up on the freebie list. There's no freebie list. I've just got your attention, though, didn't it? But uh, this is the, what we call it, the uh, early bird discount. Early bird gets the discount as well as the worm. So I would take advantage of this day. Listen, we had 75 men at the men's retreat. Amen? Yeah. So you are officially challenged, all right? So get busy. Get after it. We had a lot of visitors. We even had a couple of small churches bringing three or four men each. So you can do that as well. But I expect uh, that you get a, be a part. It's going to be a great, great uh, Retreat that you gather together. It's at the same place it's always been at Round Top. So get signed up. There are brochures. There's a table on the left when you leave the uh, worship center here in the lobby. It's at the women's ministry table. There's a screen up there with the information as well. Get a brochure. Get a registration format. At least get your deposit in today. You don't have to pay the whole thing today. But hey, if you're if you're coming, if you're even thinking about coming, get your deposit in. Get your place taken care of. Amen. So don't forget to do that. Post haste today. Amen. So, let me get into the message today. There it is. My little weather channel changer here. Called Radical Redemption. And when we begin to, to really take a look at scriptures, we really obviously can only say one thing. In view of all that God has done for us, it's just completely radical. I mean, it's, it's beyond the norm. It's beyond the extraordinary. It's outside the bounds that God would demonstrate his love for us by sending his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for us to suffer the agony of the crucifixion, to face the shame and humiliation of the cross, then triumphantly raise him from the dead. That's radical, all right? Just to radically become all he became on our behalf and give himself up for us, who obviously, lest you think otherwise, really have, we, we haven't done anything to deserve this redemption and this salvation. But God, in his mercy and his grace, sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What a great passage of scripture. And whether you understand it, comprehend it or not, hey, that's a reality. That's the truth of the word of God. That's the gospel. That's the good news that still saves and still changes. But I still really believe that since there is in this generation and in this culture that we're living in right now, such a sense of hopelessness in such a sense of despair, very few people understand that radical message of the gospel. You don't have to live your life that way. You don't have to live your life in fear. You don't have to live your life in defeat. You don't have to live your life in bondage. Listen, you can really genuinely experience what the Bible has promised to us in the Word of God. And I look back at where we are in, in, in studying the Scripture. You go back to the Old Testament, and there was a generation that was in the same setting, so to say, in many ways, at least emotionally and spiritually, that this generation is in. And it was that group of the children of Israel, the Hebrews, who were in bondage to the Egyptians. 200 years have gone by. Every year that clicks by while they're in bondage and while they're in slavery to the Egyptians, it's worse and worse and worse and more hopeless and more miserable and more despairing than the year before. Things are bad. Then in the midst of all that hopelessness and all that darkness and all that despair steps God and he manifests himself to a man named Moses at a burning bush out in the middle of nowhere, which is usually where God meets us. People say, where are you at? I'm just nowhere. My life's nowhere. I'm going nowhere. I got nowhere hopes. I got nowhere life. I got a nowhere expectation. And God shows up and he shows up as this flaming 
fire inside this plain old ordinary bush that is alive with the presence of God and speaks to Moses. All right. You say, what was so special about the bush? Nothing. Any old bush will do. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad for that? <laughs> because we can be any old bush. And God shows up and manifests his presence and speaks to Moses a message of hope that has been missing from these people's vocabulary for hundreds of years. A message of life. Let's just look at a few verses as Moses is being spoken to by God. The Lord speaks and he says, Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arms and with great judgments. Then I will take you for my people. I will be your God. You shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And I will give it to you for a possession. Semicolon. I am the Lord. Starts it, finish it. I'm the Lord. I'm in fact, as you look at this passage, you know, the statements are very clear. Three times in this passage, just little simple short verses, there are three verses. I am. I am. I am. Seven times, I will. Seven times, he makes a promise. Seven promises that unfold from this little short passage of scripture to the people who are living in darkness and the people who are living in, in bondage. Seven times he reiterates exactly what he's going to do, how he's going to do it. I don't know how much this message we'll get through. I got through about two points at Magnolia today, so we'll start and see if we get through one or two here. The first of these revelations, when he says, I am, is one we have to, to get a grip on. And I personally believe the more that I realize the truth of these three I am's and the seven I wills, the freer I get. The more expectation I have, the more joy begins to fill my life and to fill my heart. It's when I get diminished in my remembrance. You can't excuse it with old age, amen? Our mind of the flesh tends to invade the space and the territory of the mind of the spirit and push it out. But when I get back to the place of hearing from God and when I get to the place where my ears are open, then these words come ringing. I am, I am, I am. Once for the Father, once for the Son, once for the Holy Spirit. I am, I am, I am. Folks, if we can just realize that he is, you say, what does that mean? Well, Paul put it this way. In Corinthians, he writes to church and he says to them, I am what I am by the grace of God. See, nobody but God can say I am that I am, which is the way he refers to himself in scripture. I am that I am. We can only say I am what I am by my choices, by the outside influences, by environments, by whatever the world's going around me. I let things shape my life. I let things de determine my, my joy. I let things determine my direction. I let situations dictate to me sometimes way, the way I ought to act and react. But God is not like that. God is just, I am. I am. You say, well, what's that mean? I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to understand it, but I'm glad that he am. That means he is. Yes, he's alive. Yes, he's real. Yes, he, yes, he's God. But more than that, it means he is, am, is the present tense, the eternal present tense. He didn't say I was and I will be. He just says I am. And I am covers the was and will be. All right. It covers the whole factor of all that there is in time. I, he is, put it this way, the eternally present God. I heard a great preacher one time, black pastor by the name S.M. Lockridge out of Dallas, great preacher. Back when, I don't know if he's still with us or not. I was a, a young evangelist and he was speaking at a conference and he got up and, and started preaching the conference. He says, well, I was asked to come to this conference and speak to you. They gave me a topic and my topic is God is love. He said, I can't cover all that today. I started just thinking about, well, I'll take a word. Well, look at God. Well, I can't cover that today. God, I mean, how are you going to deal with God? So I thought I'll go to love. If God is, how are you going to deal with love? <laughs> if God is love. And all that means, he said, so I decided to settle on the word in the middle. <laughs> is. And he preached for about an hour on is. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Bill Clinton should have heard that message. <laughs> oh, what is is? <laughs> because he clearly laid out God is. God is. God is the one who right now, present tense, is. Now, 
Just for a moment, take off your, your, your religious hat. Okay, just take it up and set it beside you there. It'll be all right. Think in honesty with me now. Just, just to be honest. It's just us, right? We're family. God is. So how does that relate to where I am and how I'm living and what I'm doing and how I'm acting, how I'm reacting, how I respond, how I make choices, how I treat my family, how, how I act on my job, how, how I'll deal with my finance, finances. Does that have any relevance? Now we can say, put our religious hats back on. Oh, yeah, God is, praise the Lord. Amen, get him, Brother Joe. But in reality, if God is and he is the eternal I am, it should be influencing affecting my life in some scale and in some grand way or not. If he is, it should be. If, there, if he isn't, it's because, not because he, he not am, because I'm not. Paul says, I am what I am by the grace of God. In other words, he's not saying that he can never be anything for God. It's just by the grace of God, he can be anything. Amen. Sometimes we think we are the I am. We live this little narcissistic life that revolves around ourselves you know, and, and, and we let everything in the world, we think we're in charge, but literally letting everything in the world dictate our behavior and our actions, our attitudes and our emotions. He says, I am, I am, I am. I love it here, he says, but what? I am the Lord. That's the revelation this morning that if you walk out of this place, I want you to have, because if we get that revelation that I am the Lord, and he is the Lord today, now, not tomorrow, not last year, when God moved, not next month with some expectation, but right now, that revelation, I believe, can transform our lives. What are you facing? What are you dealing with? What's the struggle? What's the problem? I mean, if, we just, if it's just you and me sitting here and I say, what's the problem? Well, Brother Joe, the problem is my kids. Or Brother Joe, the problem is my, 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 my finances. Or Brother Joe, the problem is... Uh, is my job or brother Joe the problem is you know I'm not happy or brother Joe the problem is my loss and we could list a lot of problems today but I want you to know problems do come all right they come this is the world that we live in it's, it's plagued by sin and despair but as believers we do not have to let my problem or your problem take over our lives we don't have to be that generation that lives in desperation despairing hopelessness Somewhere we have to open the door to our mind and to our heart and to our spirit to realize that the Bible is true. And if God is and he is the Lord, then those things don't dictate or determine my destiny. I'm not some child of fate out here. That there is a sovereign Lord. He is the Lord. And if he is the Lord, then I can expose my difficulty, my crisis, my circumstance, my life my loss, my heartache, my sin, my condemnation, whatever it is, it can be turned over to him. And as I yield it to him, guess what? The sunshine and the ray of hope begins to gleam across my heart and life and my life begins to change. All too often, people won't take that step and it really is a step of faith. It's a step, a step or to step into the light of illumination of God's spirit and God's word and who he is. I am. And then he goes on and said, and I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. I think that was seven. Who's counting? Because he says many more I wills in scripture than, than just that. I am the Lord. I mean, what, what would that do to our worry? What would that do to our fears? What will that do to our timidity? What, what will it do to our, our failures? What happens when we bring our, 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 our sin into the light of that hope? That's the beautiful message of the gospel. That's the glorious message of the cross. And he starts dealing with these people who for 200 years have lived their lives plagued with doubts and worries and fears and despair because they heard something. They, they serve the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and they're going to give a land. They don't have any of those promises of God. And so the Lord comes and introduces himself again, which sometimes he does have to do in our lives. And it's usually... Those introductions take place in the middle of our difficulties. I am the Lord. I've got you covered. I've got you in my hand. I'm going to take care of you. And he goes through this list. And I'm going to try to cover some of this today where he talks about, here's what I will do. The first is I will, after he says, first of all, I am the Lord. And he opens and he closes with that statement of declaration and revelation that can change our lives. But from that, he says, which basically introduces that, say, if I say I can do something, will do something, I will do it. I'm the Lord. 
So no matter how possible the situation, I'm the Lord. He says, first thing, I'm going to bring you out from under your burdens. Now, in regard to the Egyptians and all that, we know what that was. But let's talk about in the relevance of today and in the light of right now. This has to do, you know, with two different areas. For one, if you do not know Christ today as your personal, I am the Lord and Savior. All right. If that's not, that relationship hadn't been established, then you are under a burden. Someone asked me when I, when I, shortly after I gave my life to Jesus, what, what was that like? I said, to me, it was like, it was like boulders rolling off my shoulders. And for the first time I could really stand up and really breathe. I could really take a full breath of life. It was like a heavy, heavy weight. But isn't that what sin does? Isn't that what condemnation does? Isn't that what guilt does? All those things, the result of sin, that's just the Bible. It's, that, it's like David said in Psalm 3, for my iniquities are gone over my head. They are as, as a heavy burden. They weigh too much for me. Jesus said, cast your cares upon me. Cast your burdens upon me. Roll them upon me. I'm meek and lowly. Learn to me. Roll those things onto Christ. But yet so many fail to do that. This I am God that was alive in the presence of Moses that day is still the same I am God that's alive with us today and who still through the New Testament, through the New Covenant, offers us this same release into freedom. That I will take the bondage and the heaviness of all that junk and all that sin and all that guilt and all that hopelessness, all that despair and condemnation, and I will give you life and I will give you an eternity and I will give you a hope but you have to take this stuff off. But it's also the same I've experienced in my own personal life and there's times where I neglect my walk with God and neglect the fellowship that he's called me to, that I have this heaviness that begins to build on my life. And I begin to bear those things up. And no, it's not the sin. I'm not out, you know, getting drunk and chasing prostitutes and getting high and snorting cocaine and anything else. But hey, it doesn't matter what kind of sin it is. Sin's a very general term for unbelief. I'm not trusting God. I'm not believing God. I'm not behaving God. I'm choosing to live my own life. And that becomes a heavy, heavy burden to bear. The Lord says to him, I will, I will bring you out from under that bondage. And that is the message of the gospels as well as the message to the children of Israel in that day. In fact, this, this passage of scripture is so prophetic for us today as well. Because it is a picture how the Lord Jesus would come a little later on and says, I will out redeem with outstretched arms. And how Christ comes. And with his arms outstretched and nailed to a cross, he saves us and redeems us and lifts us out. The issue of, of what we're dealing with here, this bondage goes into, one, being lost. There's no hope. I mean, what do you hope in when you don't know Jesus? Well, I hope I make some money. I hope I get a bigger house. I hope I have a better car. I hope I get a good relationship. I hope I can score some more drugs. I hope I can find some good liquor. <laughs> you know, I hope I can find a good woman. hope I can find a good man. Hey, there's nothing good but God. Ultimately, the relationship that's needed is not with things, material things, uh, people or other. It's nice to have a relationship. It's kind of nice to have money. But hey, the need and the hour for every one of us is our walk with God. I need to find and be found the Lord Jesus Christ. Because lostness is a heavy burden. Then there's that guilt. I know a lot of people, this just cripples. They, they've experienced a failure in their life in some regard. And even though they have confessed it to God, they're still in condemnation. They're still beat up about it. They still can't move forward beyond it. They still can't step in to God's will for their life because they're just not deserving or they, they failed in the past or all oh, this past failures heaped up. Now I'll never be anything. I can't accomplish anything. I'll never do anything for God. And what are they? They're under a burden. But God says, I'll bring you out from under that. Guilt and shame. God saves and God delivers and God cleanses and God washes us and makes us whole and makes us clean. And we dealt with this a little bit last week in Easter about the fear of death. And that's a burden. I want you to know, especially if you're knocking on death's door and you're not sure where you're going to spend eternity, that's a burden. <laughs> that's a terrible burden. But what great liberty and what great freedom there is to know that you know your heart and your life is right with God. And for you, death has no sting. And for you, death holds no fear because you know that the moment death comes, it's nothing more than a doorway into the precious sight of the Lord Jesus Christ and to God. He releases you from that. The next I will says, I will rid you of your bondage. It's good to be free of the burden. It's even greater to be free of the bondage. These are God's people in, in, in the book of Exodus. 
saved, so to say, in an Old Testament fashion, but enslaved. Saved. I belong to God, and here I am in bondage. It's not what God planned. It was their own unbelief. It was their own rebellion. It was their own choice to make decisions against the will of God. But what happens when we get in this kind of place where we have this lostness and this guiltness and this fear and this bondage, it brings unbearable pressure. You don't know why we have so many drunks and alcoholics today? They're trying to deal with this burden of bondage and fear. They don't want to deal with it. The, 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 why, why the mental hospitals are filling up. Why the pharmaceutical companies are making millions off drugs to change your attitude and make you happy pills. It's always interesting, all the happy pills that are out there, every one of them, the number one side effect is tendency to suicide. Hello. Excuse me. What's wrong with that picture? <laughs> Life and joy and peace are only going to be found in the Lord. And he says, Listen, I will bring you out. Now, the bondage ultimately is the children of Israel in, in bondage to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians. But there's simply a picture of the bondage that we invite in our own life. When we try to take control and become our own Pharaoh, a mock God, he declared himself to be God. The Pharaohs thought they were gods, but they were just, you know, narcissists, just full of themselves. Who had no idea. This one's getting ready to find out real quick about what's getting ready to go on. But all these things we allow in our life, all this bondage, as Christians that we would open ourselves up to as God's people, all the things that we would do that we thought, oh, I'll just do that and other people are doing it or it's no big deal or minimize it. You know, we're pretty good at, we know how to minimize, you know. I'm at that age where I need to magnify everything. <laughs> but when it comes to our personal sins and situations, we want to minimize it. It's not that big a deal. It's not that big. And then we always tag on, it's not that big a deal because so-and-so's doing it. Now, if so-and-so's doing it, it must not be a big deal. That's how important your testimony is, by the way. It's not a big deal. Everybody's doing it. It's not a big deal. It is a big deal. If it, if it opens the door for despair, if it opens the door for hopelessness, if it opens the door to depression, it's a big deal. You close that door. You walk in the freedom that Jesus Christ has purchased for you. But so many, so many people in our churches, they're not walking in that. They're not walking in that liberty. In fact, I, I went back and said, you know, as, as I looked about this, these two words here about the burdens and the bondage, let, let's just look at just a, a five quick spots and we'll, we'll, we'll deal with this part today and we'll carry it, pick it up next week. The, first of all, as you go back to Exodus chapter one, it says their service was mandated, all right? It was compulsory. Exodus 1, 14, they made their lives bitter with hard bondage and mortar and brick, all manner of service in the field, all their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. I mean, serve, 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 rigor, hardness, difficulty, severity, you know, uh, now, we, we're not facing that kind of bondage and burden today, but I want you to know many Christians kind of by, by their failure to enjoy the fellowship that God's called them to live in, choose to live in the fellowship of the world or, the, or, or their own flesh or the devil, and it opens the door for all this service, service, bondage, difficulty, hard time. Doesn't it? I mean, just look, just look. Most people are what we would call in the church day weary and well-doing. You know, they're doing well in so many different areas, but they're weary in it. They just kind of, they're bummed out. I mean, it's example of the illustration. Well, I, I saw Rebecca's uh, brochure on the, on the ladies retreat coming up and it says duty or delight. And I thought that's the perfect illustration here. For many people, their Christian life isn't delight. It's just sheer duty. And it's like that dutiful housewife. When she first got married, she loved to get up and make the bed for him. Oh, if there were underwear on the floor, sock, no problem. Pew, I'll wash those up for him. He's going to be so happy. Am I right, women? You know. And then until after a few months of that, can't you pick up your own stuff? <laughs> you know, that, that, that joy is gone. And many times it's lost because of the lack of appreciation for the one you're trying to do service for. So it goes both ways in that regard. Amen. The idea here is that people grow that way in their, in their Christian service. They get like that dutiful housewife. There's, there's no love. There's, there's no joy. It's kind of like, oh, I got to do it again. I got to go Sunday. I got to lead a lift group. I got to sing another song. I got to play this. I got to do that. I got to stand and greet guests. I got to be in the welcome center. I got to work in the nursery. Children's ministry after children's ministry day. On and on. We just miss the joy of just serving Jesus. Amen. The joy of making a difference in somebody's life. The joy that comes from, from and just letting God be himself through our lives. And, and Satan is always there to remind us, oh, it's hard. It's difficult. It's going to cost you. It's, it, there's a sacrifice that's going to be involved. And this is where they were. They had this idea, you know. 
that, 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 that my life's just miserable. My Christian service is miserable. But not only that, it, it felt it was compulsory. And theirs was. Their sorrow is constant. Look at verse 7 of chapter 3 when he says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. I know their sorrows. Affliction, their cries, their sorrows. Afflictions, their cries, their sorrows. Like a, lot, a lot of people like that, and they're even in their Christian walk today. They're so, it's, it's, we talk about having the pity party, you know. They show up for the pity party every time it's called. Nobody else does. <laughs> but they show up for it. And they get all wrapped up in just how difficult things are for me. And my life is just not happy, and I'm not happy. And, so I just, and then they start making stupid decisions. About change this and change that and do this. And they just miss it completely. And they become completely wrapped up in their own world. And when you read Psalms 51, remember that great passage where David is confessing his sin before the Lord? And as he's confessing his sin, he tacks something onto it that maybe we need to start tacking onto our prayer. He says, and Lord, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Bring back the joy again. But for too many believers in the church, it's become drudgery. Prayer's a hassle. Witnessing, I ain't got time for that church if it's not raining. On and on it goes. Just miss it. And they're in that state of sorrow. A lot just, at that point, a lot of people just quit going to church even. Or if they do stay, they just gripe all the time. Nothing's good enough, you know. No ministry is sufficient enough. No sermon's great enough. No, it's just on and on. They're always trying to pick out stuff. If you're in the pick out mode, get over it. The problem's not everybody else. You're the problem. Get it right. Get back to the joy of the Lord. Which brings me to the three. Third part, he says here, they're sacrifices. Exodus 3, 18. They shall hearken to thy voice. You shall come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt. And you shall say to him, the Lord God of Hebrews has met with us. That's a good start, isn't it? Tell that to the devil. Now let us go. We beseech you three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. There hadn't been sacrifices for a long, long time. All right. No real spiritual worship and service has been taking place congregationally with these people. They've been given in to the hard, cruel life that they've been living. Now, the story begins like this. If you've watched the Ten Commandments, some of you maybe hadn't read the Bible, but if you saw the movie. <laughs> It starts with them going to Pharaoh and they just want to go for a three days journey in the wilderness and have church, make a sacrifice. He said, no. By the way, you don't have to ask permission for the devil for anything anymore, okay? They started off good and they went to Pharaoh. Pharaoh, the Lord our God has spoken to us. Oh, you said, I'm sorry. <laughs> what you said? And we end up with what the world says instead of just believing. Pharaoh said no. Hey, the devil always says no. The world always says no to sacrifice and service. The flesh always says no to sacrifice and service. But when you make the sacrifice to serve God in whatever degree it might be, that's when the grace comes. Amen. I shared yesterday with somebody, this morning, Ronnie and I, Mason and I were talking about a guy who invited to church. And I told him, I said, you know, they're not coming through Magnolia and I'm headed across town, what little town there is, in the main intersection, I'm coming across it and a guy decides he's going to turn in front of me. He's going to beat the light. I don't know what he thought he was going to do with me. So he turns in front of me, bam, I hit him, you know. He pulls over, and we pull around and pull over. And he's all, oh, I'm so sorry. I, didn't, I thought you were turning. I said, well, there's a turn lane. I wasn't even in that. You know, if you're going to turn left. So I'm not turning. I, I, no, I don't think. I'm just, I, I, I. You know, and, and you can do two things here. Y'all know what they are, right? You can get all frustrated and all mad and all irritated about everything you got to do now. Or you can praise the Lord. So I said, Jake, where's your, where's your insurance tag and your license? I said, put it on the hood. And I put mine here. We'll just take some pictures. We'll, we'll deal with this and be on our way. He said, Ch -ch -ch. I said, oh, by the way, I said, uh, I don't believe in accidents. So we just had one. I said, no, we didn't. I said, I believe in encounters. I believe in, I, I believe in the divine hand of God and the sovereignty of God. I said, so, you know, I, I think maybe you need me, me to invite you to, 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 to the to church. Oh, I know the Lord. He said, I just moved here. He said, I, I've been going to a church. I'm not happy with it a little bit of time. My family's moving down next month, and I took a new job here. And it's just an opportunity to witness to him, invite him to church and stuff. And then we went on our ways. Ronnie May said, oh, pastor, I am so proud of you. That's what you've been preaching. I was talking about I said, oh, before you get too proud, let me tell you another story. I says, I was at Lowe's yesterday. 
and I went to get some topsoil and some mulch because I was doing some landscape in the yard. And I get in line, and I have somebody behind the counter. Well, you've heard of counterintelligence? <laughs> Who didn't have it? Obviously, this guy didn't know if he's going. Apparently, probably his first day on the job, where things were going, because he's having to ask the supervisor behind him everything, and he was kind of watching all the deals there. And I'm getting him paid. I got stuff to do. The sovereignty of God thing some other day. You know, I got a big day, a lot of work to get to. My mind is task oriented. All right. And you know, if you were on staff right now, what that means with me, get out of my way, <laughs> make it short. All right. It, he couldn't make it short. I said, I want two bags of topsoils. I want two. You know, you, well, what kind of topsoil? I said, the cheapest topsoil you got, just dirt. Give me the cheapest dirt you got. Okay. Here, I can't buy dirt. That's first of all, irritated me. <laughs> like buying water in a bottle, you know, it's ridiculous. So I'm buying this dirt, and I said, and uh, he's okay, it's this one. He turned around, well, what, what, what's our cheapest dirt? And finally, the guy comes over and says, that's the cheapest dirt right there. What else you want? I want 10 bags of mulch. What kind of mulch? We have kinds? Kinds of mulch? I said, how about the cheapest mulch? It's just old dead trees all ground up anyway, right? And I'm buying old dead trees. I got plenty of old dead trees on my property. You know, but I didn't have anything to grind them up with. Okay, that's 10 bags of mulch. That's $3.83. I said, you don't know have anything on sale? Uh, just a second. Oh, nothing's on sale. Okay, and I don't want any mulch. I know where to get mulch on sale. I've seen the ad. I can go down a few blocks and get mulch on sale. And so I told him, no, no, thank you for the mulch. And I had a few other things I was getting. He's, you know, the few things. And I finally turned around the guy back and said, I'm sorry, this won't take much longer. You know, but you, I feel the little steam starting to boil up in here. You ever get that? Everyone's kind of goes right up in there behind the ears right there. It's kind of coming up. And he says, all right, so it'll be such, 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 such. I said, thank you. And he said, hands me street. He said, you can pick up your mulch around the corner. I said, I didn't order mulch. He said, sir, you ordered, raised voice, like, sir, you ordered mulch. I couldn't believe he did that to start with. Now, now it's really coming, <laughs> you know, starting to build. I'm, I have a testimony trying to protect here. I said, sir, <clears throat> I did not order mulch. If you want to get your supervisor over here, he heard what I said. I ordered two bags of dirt and no 10 bags of mulch. No mulch. No, sir. You said mulch and I typed it in. Don't raise your voice with me. Oh, he doesn't know I can raise my voice. I practice on Sundays raising my voice. <laughs> I said, try to get the Holy Spirit sense, chill out, you know. So I said, just what does the receipt say you just typed? It says two bags of dirt. I said, somebody needs to take a chill pill. <laughs> Took my receipt and walked out. Got my dirt, got in the car and drove home. And the Holy Spirit just fell on me like, that was really stupid. Because here's what I caught myself. I caught myself thinking of all the things I could have really said to him. Yes. Really straightened him out. I'm a clever guy that way. Get myself in trouble real easy. And I thought of all these stupid things. Like about the time the Lord said, why didn't you just, you know, tell him about me? He was a great candidate to hear from me about then. He was a, tied up in a knot probably all day from three or four people he'd already messed up with. That'd be a great opportunity. And I just felt like dirt, two bags worth. <laughs> now, here's the point. One, you make a sacrifice and you see joy. God does something. One with no sacrifice, what do you have? More sorrow. More sorrow. I can tell you with every temptation to do something stupid in your life, no matter what it is, there's always another out. The Bible says God makes a way with every, with every, with every temptation. So right along beside that, if we take long enough to see it, but instead we choose not to do that. We choose to focus on something else. We lose the glory, we lose the joy, and we miss it which leads us to continue living that way, then the situation is even more confusing. Exodus 5, then the officers of the children of Israel came and cried unto Pharaoh, 
Why are you treating us this way? Why are you dealing with us like this? Why, why? Listen, you're not going to get a satisfactory answer from the world when you ask those kind of questions. Some of you blame God for all the things going on in your life. In some degree, God may have allowed them to get your attention to move away from that narcissistic kind of living to a full life that's centered on Jesus and not on self. To get to the point of saying, Lord, I see, now I see what you're doing. The lights are coming on. You got something else going on here. You got somebody's life that needs to be touched. You got a situation that needs to be influenced by righteousness and by, by your kingdom. And we just miss it. And we just, we walk away, oh, why is this happening to me? I can't, I can't see what God's up to. And all of a sudden, our expectations are gone. Our sense of joy is gone. Faith walk becomes a thing of the past. And we're frustrated with God. We're frustrated with everybody else. Spiritual bipolar. <laughs> Fly off the handle. Which leads to the fifth of this situation. Exodus 9 says, Moses spoke to the children of Israel, but they hearkened not unto Moses for anguish of spirit. They were so despair and so defeated, they missed what God was up to. They missed what God was going to do. God knew how long Pharaoh was going to say no. God's just preparing the ground for the miraculous and preparing them for the miraculous. And now they're getting close to the place of no hope and no life. You know what happens in our life? Without even realizing that we start yielding the world, the flesh, the devil. But remember, that's not just terminology. That really does mean that we begin to, to, to yield our mind and our life and our attitudes to, to situations that, that they are unseen situations. And many of them are demonically manipulated. And we're just dancing with the enemy and, and, and not even realize it. The Bible says the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And it goes on to say, and it's in the midst of you. What is? Righteousness. That you can live right with God. Peace, that you can have the peace of God in your life. Joy in the Holy Ghost. The Bible says that Jesus himself was anointed with the oil of gladness above all his fellows. I mean, too, I think too many we've seen the movie Jesus and the, and the Bible store picture Jesus, you know. You, you walk into the church and there's Jesus and he's always kind of looking up into the heavens with this somber, empty look on his face. Nice European nose. Doesn't look Jewish at all. <laughs> like he's waiting for the next line or something in his script. That's not Jesus. Jesus was filled with life. He was filled with joy. He was filled with passion. He was anointed, catch it, with the oil of gladness. May God anoint us afresh and anew with that same oil in our life. You know where I think we get wrong? I think we get wrong when we, even when we first come to Jesus, how we counsel people. People come to Christ, brokenness, ready to serve God, live for God, love Jesus, and we say, here's what you need to do, and we give them a list, four or five things. You do these things, you'll be a good Christian. I mean, don't, you gotta pray, you gotta read your Bible, you know, you gotta, you gotta go to church, you gotta give your money, you know, and be faithful, you know, tell other people about Jesus. Good principles. Now, those things are good habits to have in our life, but they don't make us right with God. It's not a works. Once we get saved or after we get saved, it's just that God has a relationship for us to walk in. Oh, but you do this, 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 you'll be happy. And by the way, uh, uh, you ought to be teaching Sunday school. And we give them a little Sunday school quarterly or something to go teach a Bible study because we've been told, hey, as soon as you get people involved in church, they're less likely to leave the church. So let's find something for them to do. So we give them five things to do plus whatever else we can get them to do. Instead of teaching them, you know what this whole thing's about? It's about you having a relationship with the Lord God himself. Where ultimately, this relationship is so real and so genuine. Do you have a friend? Yes, he's as real as that friend. Do you have a best friend? Absolutely. He's more important than that best friend even. And he's God. So you have this great relationship upward that he's the king of glory, but he's also, and you're a servant of his. Yes, but I'm also, he said, I not only call you my servant, I call you my friend. And we end up with what I call the last words of the flesh. And they're pretty simple here. I will do it for you, Jesus. We make those disciples all the time. And I'll do it for you, Jesus. It starts out exciting. And then God begins to deal with them. They start not discovering that relationship I talked about in the fellowship. And then it's, oh, I'll do it for Jesus, you know. And then pretty soon you're twisting your arm to finally get something done for Jesus. Now oh, I'll do it for Jesus, you know. I'll do it for Jesus. Okay, I'll do it for Jesus. And let me tell you what that breaks down to. The more you live your life without any revelation of the, of the glory of God and the kingdom of God, one is, it gets down to I, it breaks down, I'll do it. Jesus said, you can't do anything without me, but we think we can. 
I'll do it. And then it gets to, I will. It kind of boils down to this. If not for my glory, the Lord's glory, at least my honor. I'll take credit for it. <laughs> and we miss it. And it says, I will do, which really basically means, well, after all, you know, I feel better when I've done something for God. It make me feel good. That's why a lot of people are religious because it makes them feel good. It, it, it pampers their pride. But I will do what? I will do it, whatever it might be. Because I don't mind this task. I'll, I'll do this one. Because something I don't mind, I don't know if I'm going to be so willing to say I'll do it for Jesus. Because there are many things that many Christians are impressed to do for the Lord, they just don't do. But if it's within the my bounds of my reason and my strength, I'll do it. For, now Lord, just step aside. Slip aside. I'm going to do this for you. Watch me. You know where that leads. You need my help. God, which, you know, and when we say Jesus, it really gets down to this, you're so blessed to have me. I wish everybody in the church was like me. I wish they were all as spiritual as I am. Look at all I do for God. And then you, you, you wear out, you burn out, you soon you fly out. Because you just, the, the flesh profits nothing if that's where you're operating. You say, then how do you operate? You operate by surrendering that moment, that day, that desire, that request, that situation to the Lord. And you begin to realize, hey, I am not in this alone. I am not in this alone. I'm not by myself here. And even though no one else may even know what I'm dealing with, I'm still not alone. Even though I, I may cry out and nobody hears my cry, I'm still not alone. And I want you to let that soak in today because that's where your hope is going to begin to flourish. I have Christ the Lord in my presence because he is the eternal I am. So that means he's eternally right here, right now. And if I have him, what more could I ask for? Because the Bible tells me, if God be for me, who can be against me? I have what I need, who I need, when I need, where I need. I can't get away from that. So I close my eyes and start looking at other places. Are you with me? Anything I want you to leave here with today? Yes. Hope. Hope. Because some of you are facing some hard situations in your life. Leave here with hope. And those that aren't, you will sooner or later. Leave here remembering there's hope. You're not ever by yourself in this deal. Ever. Don't lose hope. Would you stand with your heads bowed?